Thank you all so much for being here. My name is Cara Marie Bedell. I'm a board member for the Mosaic Project. Um, we are so excited to have this conversation with Richard Rothstein today. Um, I would now love to thank our sponsors, who I think we'll see on the screen in just a moment here. There they are. Um, so Kachit Petrie and McCarthy, Clark Hill, Spur, Kays and McLean Partners Foundation, Dorsal Capital, Jams Foundation, Leaders Forum, Porchlight, and Africa World Books. Thank you all so much for helping us make this event possible. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about why we're having this conversation. I know that um, many of you have been a part of the Mosaic family for a long time, but a lot of you are here just for the very first time. Um, so I feel like we need to contextualize why we're bringing Richard in at this particular moment. So the Mosaic Project is an organization that um, brings people from elementary school students all the way up to adults in the workplace together to talk about or to build their skills for conflict resolution and assertive communication. Uh, our principal program is an outdoor school for fourth and fifth graders where we take three kids, three schools from across the Bay Area, bring them together, mix them in, and again, talk about how to build conflict resolution, how to do assertive communication. And because the Bay Area is extremely segregated, much like the rest of the world, as we'll talk about today, those schools often uh, follow along racial lines, follow along cultural lines. And so we bring, when we bring three schools together from three different economic levels, we also mix race, culture, background, status, all of those things. Um, and we've learned through our work that obviously <laughs> segregation can lead to some terrible things. In fact, if you look here at our, our uh, pyramids of violence, you can see that you maybe have heard this idea that prejudice leads to discrimination, leads to violence and war. That's kind of common knowledge, I think. But at Mosaic, we're very intentional about adding these bottom two rungs of the pyramid, ignorance and fear. Um, which come from segregation. And segregation doesn't have to mean someone extremely far away from you. It can be someone in, you know, across the tracks. It can be someone even in your same building or your same school environment because the systems to keep us apart are really, really, really strong, which again, we'll be talking about today. We also believe at Mosaic that in order to take down segregation, we have to replace it with something, um, which is our pyramid of peace. And so the first rung of the pyramid of peace is connection. And I think it's really important at this moment to think about, okay, where have we come from? Because we can't truly understand segregation unless we understand its roots, especially here in the United States. And then that helps us to inform and color the kind of connection that we're building at Mosaic, which can lead to respect and recognition of others' perspectives, empathy, assertive communication and peace. And remind us that that has to be a practice because we have all these systems in place that are there to keep us separate. So we have to constantly be practicing our connection, practicing our respect and working on that all the time. Um, and I think that leads us pretty well into Richard Rothstein, who is, of course, um, has some experience in the education in addition to being um, a prolific writer. Um, he is, excuse me, he is the Distinguished Fellow of Economic Policy Institute and a Senior Fellow Emeritus at the Thurgood Marshall Institute of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. He's the author of, again, a lot of articles and books about race and education, but his most recent book, the thing that we're here to talk about today, is The Color of Law, A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America, the top 10 New York Times bestseller. And so we're so excited to have Richard here today to help us contextualize the history of segregation so we can move forward. And I think Mosaic talks a lot about um, building, taking action. Right now, there's a lot of talk about being anti-racist, which is so important, but what is the action that we're replacing it with and how do we determine that? And so hopefully Richard will help us understand this history of segregation so we can move forward right now. Um, so without further ado, I would love to introduce Richard. See if we can get him on. I'm here. Ah, hi. <laughs> hi, how are you? Good, it's so good to see you again. Good to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, I guess we should just hop right on in because um, we only have a limited amount of time and I want to make sure we give people a chance to ask questions. Um, so I wonder if you can just start out by talking to us about why our communities are segregated. Who's responsible? How did it happen? Okay. <laughs> that does get right into it. Yeah. <laughs> we have a national myth. Uh, it's shared by all of us. Uh, African Americans, whites, liberals, conservatives, um, northerners, southerners, everyone. We, we believe that the reason we have neighborhood segregation in this country, and let me say that every metropolitan area is residentially segregated, uh, clearly defined areas that are all white and mostly white, clearly defined areas that are all black or mostly black, uh, sometimes uh, allegedly desegregated with other low-income uh, minority families. 
Um, we think that uh, we call it de facto segregation. We all use this term. Uh, by that we mean it happened because of private bigotry of maybe landlords or, or uh, homeowners refusing to sell or rent to African Americans. Uh, we think it happened maybe because banks or real estate agents, uh, private businesses, not government, uh, discriminated in how they sold or rented homes. We think it happened maybe because people just like to live with each other, the same race. They, we feel more comfortable that way. Or maybe uh, because of income differences. Uh, on average, African Americans have lower incomes than whites, not all, but on average. And so many can't afford to live in white middle-class neighborhoods. We think all of these things came together to create residential segregation. We call it de facto segregation. It just happened in fact, not in law. And we tell ourselves, and the Supreme Court has endorsed this view, if it happened by accident, it can only unhappen by accident. The Supreme Court has actually said if we have de facto segregation, government is permit, prohibited from taking any action to undo it. Well, as I said, it's a total myth. As you mentioned, I, I've been involved for most of my uh, career, the last 30 years, on education policy, uh, not, um, not housing policy. I came to this from the education side. I um, looked at a Supreme Court decision in 2007 that investigated the um, uh, a plan of both the Louisville, Kentucky, and Seattle, Washington school districts that um, had a very, very token desegregation plan. They gave parents the choice of which uh, schools in the district uh, their children would attend. But if the schools were, go if the choices were going to further exacerbate racial segregation, it wouldn't be honored. So if you had an all white or a mostly white school and both the black and the white child applied for that last place, uh, the black child would be given some preference. A very token trivial plan of how often do you have one place left in the school and the, both the black and the white child apply for it. The Supreme Court denounced it. Chief Justice John Roberts wrote um, the opinion, the controlling opinion. He said the schools in Louisville and Seattle were segregated because the neighborhoods in which they located were segregated. It's a pretty wise observation on the Chief Justice's part. That is, in fact, why the schools in, in all of our cities are segregated. And then he went on to say that the neighborhoods were segregated de facto for the reasons I just described. And he said, therefore, uh, the, the school districts of Louisville and Seattle were prohibited from doing anything to fix it. Well, I read that decision, and this is in 2007. I remember the case in Louisville, Kentucky, one of the two school districts that were involved in this decision. In Louisville, Kentucky, there was a white homeowner in a single family home in an all white suburb of Louisville called Shively. He uh, had a, a, an African American friend living in the center city of Louisville, a decorated Navy veteran. Uh, he had the the African-American friend had a wife and a child. He had a middle-class job. He could afford a single family home, but no one would sell him one. So the white homeowner in Shively bought another home in his community, another single family home and resold it to his African-American friend. And when the African-American family moved in, a mob of white surrounded the home protected by the police they threw rocks through the windows. The police made no effort to stop it. They dynamited and firebombed the home. Uh, the police made no effort to stop it. But when the riot was all over, the state of Kentucky arrested, tried, convicted, and jailed with a 15-year sentence, the white homeowner for sedition, for having sold a, a home in a white neighborhood to a black family. And I said to myself, this doesn't sound to me much like de facto segregation. If the uh, police, the criminal justice system, prosecutors are all working in concert to maintain racial boundaries in, in Louisville, Kentucky. And when I looked into it farther, I discovered that this was not unique. There were um, police protected mobs driving African Americans out of homes uh, that they either rented or legitimately purchased in white neighborhoods. Sometimes the police even organized these mobs. Every one of them across the country, and there were hundreds and hundreds of these cases, not just in border states like Kentucky, but in New York and Chicago and Detroit and Philadelphia and Los Angeles and San Francisco, everywhere there were cases like this of police and force violence, driving African-Americans out of homes in white neighborhoods. Every one of them was a constitutional violation. If the police were doing this, it was a 14th Amendment violation. This is not de facto segregation. And I began to look into it further. 
and I found that there were many, many federal, state, and local policies, explicitly racial, that were designed to ensure that blacks and whites could not live near one another uh, in any metropolitan area in the country. It's not that there wasn't private bigotry. Of course there was. That mob in Louisville was a bigoted white mob. But without police protection, without police uh, enforcement of the segregation, they wouldn't have been able to drive that family out of, out of its home. And so the government uh, structure uh, is what uh, I think is, is underlies the segregation of this country. And in, in my book, The Color of Law, um, I've documented dozens and dozens of these policies and, and no fact in that book has ever been challenged by a, a, a professional historian of this period, although we don't learn about it anymore. Let me just briefly uh, say, um, uh, display, explain, describe one big policy that the federal government uh, uh, followed, although I, I don't have time to go into very many. The biggest policy that the federal government followed to create segregation in this country was a post-war World War II program to um, suburbanize the entire white working class population of every metropolitan area in this country. Prior to that, white and black workers typically lived in urban areas because they didn't have cars to drive to work from suburb, suburbs and factories. We were a manufacturing economy. We're typically located in a central area near a deep water port or a railroad terminal because that's how they got their parts and shipped their final products. As the highways began being built and as returning war veterans had jobs in the post-war economy and they could drive to work, the government, the federal government began an explicit, racially explicit policy to move the white working class population out of cities into single family homes and suburbs like that one in Louisville in every metropolitan area of the country. The most well-known one is um, uh, Levitt, Levittown, east of New York City, 17,000 homes in one place, but there were many in the Bay Area as well. Uh, uh, Westlake and Daly City is perhaps a good example, 15,000 homes in one place. The developers of these subdivisions in the post-World War II period could never have assembled the capital to build these subdivisions, to buy the land, to construct the houses. Uh, nobody would be crazy enough to lend them the money to do this. No bank would do it. Uh, we were at the suburban country. The banks didn't think that anybody would want to live in these places. The only way that these developers, and they, they exist in every metropolitan area of this country, the only way that they could assemble the capital to buy the land, build the developments, was by going to the Federal Housing Administration and the Veterans Administration, submitting their plans for the development, the materials they were going to use, the architectural design, the layout of the streets, and a required commitment never to sell a home to an African-American. This was an explicit racial commitment that they had to make to the Federal Housing Administration and the Veterans Administration. The government even required builders like Levitt or Henry Dolger, the builder of Westlake, or any of the others in between, hundreds and hundreds of these developments, to put a clause in the deed of every home prohibiting resale to African-Americans or rental to African-Americans. And these clauses still exist in, in the deeds of, of these homes today. Whites, uh, this was not, let me just say, this was not the action of rogue bureaucrats uh, in the Federal Housing Administration or Veterans Administration. It was written out in the Federal Policy Manual for um, underwriting uh, uh, developments for guaranteeing federal bank loans for, to, to builders. The underwriting manual said that an appraiser could not recommend for a federal bank guarantee a development that would sell to an African American. Uh, the underwriting manual went so far as to say you couldn't guarantee a bank loan for an all-white development if it happened to locate near where African Americans were living, because in the words of the manual, that would run the risk of infiltration by inharmonious racial groups. That's what the federal policy manual said. This notion of de facto segregation is other nonsense. We have an unconstitutional system of racial segregation, and like the unconstitutional forms of segregation that the civil rights movement succeeded in forcing the abolition of in the 1960s, we need a new civil rights movement today that's going to redress this civil rights violation. The federal government, when it was requiring segregation of the suburbs it was creating, was violating the Fifth Amendment. It's a civil rights violation. It needs to be remedied. Well, let me just say that the homes that these are uh, uh, White families were sub subsidized to buy working class families. This was these were not these were returning war veterans. People had jobs in the post war economy. 
these developments were very inexpensive. The homes in places like Levittown or Westlake or any of the places in between sold in today's money for about $90,000, $100,000. As you know, uh, homes in these subdivisions do not sell for $100,000 today. They sell for three hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars in some parts of the country, in, in the Bay Area, a uh, million dollars or more. The white families who bought those homes gained over the next few generations wealth from the equity appreciation that they gained as the homes increased in value. They used that wealth to send their children to college. They used it to take care of temporary emergencies, maybe temporary unemployment. Uh, they used it to subsidize their retirements and they used it to bequeath wealth to their children and grandchildren, who then uh, were able to have down payments for their own homes. African-Americans were prohibited from participating in this wealth generating exercise. They continued to live in rented apartments, either in public housing or the private market in urban areas for the most part. They gained none of this wealth. Today, uh, the result is that while African-American incomes are about 60%, of white incomes on average. Uh, there's a whole story behind that income gap. Uh, uh, you're not going to give me time to go into that today. I'll just uh, restrict myself to uh, the wealth gap. Uh, but African-American wealth on average is only about 5% of, of white wealth. And that enormous disparity between a 60% income ratio and a 5% wealth ratio is entirely attributable the unconstitutional federal housing policy that was practiced in the mid 20th century, that we as Americans have an obligation under our constitution to remedy. Um, that wealth gap underlies much of the racial inequality we have in this country today. It underlies the achievement gap in schools when we concentrate the most disadvantaged families in single neighborhoods where they don't have the wealth to obtain better housing. Their children come to school with social and economic disadvantages that make it uh, difficult, if not impossible in most cases, for schools to overcome them. When we concentrate schools where every child has either asthma or lead poisoning or homelessness or economic insecurity that impedes their achievement. A child with asthma um, may be uh, uh, up at night wheezing, more likely than a child without asthma. African-Americans uh, children in urban areas have asthma at four times the rate of middle class, four times the rate of middle class white children. Uh, asthma, as I say, lead poisoning, homelessness, economic insecurity, all of these things, when you concentrate them in single schools, it uh, makes it impossible for schools to uh, address them sufficiently to um, uh, achieve at the level of schools where children come to school healthy and well rested from secure homes um, uh, that are economically secure. So the wealth gap uh, that has created this segregation um, uh, predicts the achievement gap. It predicts uh, uh, health disparities between African-Americans and whites. African-Americans, as you know, have shorter life expectancies on average, or greater rates of cardiovascular disease. Uh, because they are concentrated, so many of them are concentrated in less healthy neighborhoods, more pollution, more uh, uh, diesel trucks running through their neighborhoods, more vermin in the environment, more dilapidated buildings, more dust. Uh, they uh, um, have no access or little access to, to markets that sell fresh food. The, the wealth gap and the segregation that we've created uh, predicts the mass incarceration crisis and the police uh, brutality that we have been protesting in the Black Lives Matter movement for the last couple of months. If we weren't concentrating the most disadvantaged young men, African-American men in particular, uh, in single neighborhoods without access to good jobs or the transportation to get to those jobs, without access uh, to schools that uh, have students with high achievement. Um, uh, if we weren't concentrating those young men in single places, the police wouldn't be behaving like an occupying force in the same way that colonial police forces in places like India or the Congo behave. We have a caste system that we've created in this country unconstitutionally, and the police have the role of patrolling the, that lower caste and ensuring its um, complicity and, and, and uh, compliance with uh, segregation. Uh, the police would certainly be discriminatory as well if, if, if we weren't so segregated, but not nearly to the, such great extent uh, 
when police are operating in a segregated neighborhood outside the eye of the broader population, they can uh, behave in ways that would not be tolerated if African Americans were had access to higher opportunity communities. And I'll say one final thing in answer to your question. That segregation that we have created in an unconstitutional fashion is a, a, an important cause of the very, very dangerous and frightening political polarization that we have in this country today. Uh, it's not entirely racial, but it largely tracks racial lines, as we all know. How can we ever develop the, the common national identity that we need to preserve this democracy if so many African Americans and whites we live so far from each other that we can't understand each other's life experiences, we can't empathize with each other, we can't, as I say, build a, a common national identity. So the segregation that we as a people through our government has created underlies the most serious social problems that you're facing, that you're working with, and that groups like yours uh, all over the country are working with. And uh, we can try to address, and we should address, I am not saying, well, obviously it has to be a high priority to address the immediate consequences of the segregation, which is uh, schools that uh, can't perform as well as they should, uh, which includes evictions and, and uh, homelessness and uh, uh, inability to pay rent in the COVID crisis. We need to address all those. But we also need to keep in mind the underlying cause of these problems, and in the long run, also uh, redress uh, the segregation that we've created. Wow. <laughs> <Woo. laughs> I mean, I think what you're saying, I think for those of us who work in education um, and who work in our, especially in diversity education with groups of different students, see exactly what you're talking about, the higher rates of asthma from specific demographics, the, the wealth concentrated in certain communities. Um, but you, you talk a bit about in your book about the fact that segregation is really bad for everybody. I won't say that it's bad for everyone to the same extent. Obviously, that is not the case. But you say in your book that segregation can give whites an unrealistic belief in their own superiority, actually leading to their poor performance if they feel less need to challenge themselves. You already highlighted a bunch of the reasons and uh, ways that for for low-income African-American and other brown communities, it can be extremely detrimental to be segregated in this way. So I'm wondering uh, why we still see so much resistance. You talked about John Roberts um, in his decision recently, this was only 2007, just about 10 years ago, that where he was still in allowing for and enforcing this not at all de facto segregation. Why do we see such resistance? And do you believe this is maybe a moment that we can use to, to to shift things, especially since we're seeing a moment of reckoning right now in social movements. Yes, I'm very, very hopeful. I'm very hopeful. Um, I'm not confident, but I'm hopeful. Um, you know, we are having a more accurate and passionate discussion about not only the history I just described, but uh, about racial inequality generally in this country than we ever have had before in American history, ever before in American history. Uh, the Black Lives Matter demonstrations that we had, over 20 million Americans participated, over 20 million. Uh, many of them, uh, I think actually a majority of them, were white. Uh, this is unprecedented. Uh, we need to learn this history. Uh, we need to um, act on it. Uh, and we have the preconditions now with this new awareness where we can do it. Um, I, uh, you know, I'll say frankly, you know, I wrote this book uh, describing the history of, of de jure segregation, uh, segregation by government policy and law and regulation. Uh, my publisher um, uh, published, uh, printed 5,000 copies um, of the book. I had no expectation that it was going to have this kind of impact, uh, but it's not just my book. It's uh, Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow. It's Brian Stevenson's book, Just Mercy. Um, and of course, it's the, the wonderful uh, cell phones that take uh, pictures of, um, of police uh, abuse of African Americans and murder in some cases uh, that uh, has made people aware of things that they weren't aware of before. But the next step has to be uh, converting that awareness to action, to a new civil rights movement. Uh, John Lewis, uh, the late John Lewis, uh, and, and many of you I'm sure have uh, read of his, his obituary or seen uh, the film about him, he talked about good trouble. And we need uh, 
the, mem the participants in the Black Lives Matter demonstrations now to move beyond simply sign waving and creating local civil rights groups that are going to create good trouble uh, in order to uh, make it uncomfortable to maintain the um, residential boundaries, the segregation that we have today. Understanding the history is the first step. And I know that you're all working in schools. One of the first things that you can do is insist that schools teach this history accurately. And I'm not just talking about teaching it in schools where minorities predominate. I'm talking about teaching it to white students accurately. I examined, uh, in the course of writing this book, if, if you read it, you know this, I examined the most commonly used American history textbooks in American high schools today. Every one of them lies about this history. And I'm not uh, using that word um, with, without consideration. Every one of them lies about this history. Uh, the, the most commonly used American textbooks brag about the, the action of the federal government in creating suburbs in the post-World War II period, never mentioning that uh, it was created for whites only on a racially explicit basis. They talk about, I didn't, get, I didn't talk about it before, but um, uh, uh, they talk about the, the public housing that, that was first built in this country during the New Deal. They don't mention that the public housing was for middle-class, working-class, white families, uh, and that African-Americans, to the extent they got public housing, were always in segregated projects, creating segregation in communities where they hadn't previously existed. As, as you know, in, in my book, uh, uh, I like to talk about the self-satisfied smug places that uh, think they're better than everywhere else. Uh, you know, some of you live in one of those. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, for example, Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, the area between Harvard and MIT, maybe you've heard of it called the Central Square neighborhood, was a fully integrated neighborhood in the 1930s. Uh, the Public Works Administration, the first New Deal agency to build public housing in this country, um, segregated that neighborhood by building separate projects for African Americans and whites, creating segregation where it hadn't previously existed. But the great African American novelist, playwright, uh, Langston Hughes, talks about in his autobiography how he grew up in an uh, integrated downtown Cleveland neighborhood. That's not how we think of uh, downtown Cleveland today. It was the central neighborhood of Cleveland. He said in high school, he dated a Jewish girl. He, his best friend was Polish. It's what you'd expect to see in an integrated high school in an integrated neighborhood. The Public Works Administration went into that neighborhood and segregated it by creating separate public housing projects for African Americans and for whites. Our textbooks don't describe this. Uh, they, they talk only about the great work that the Public Works Administration did in creating jobs for the first time, for and did, uh, but never talking about the fact that all of those policies were on a segregated basis. So that's some work that we can do in schools immediately to get started. We need uh, local citizen groups, uh, civil rights groups, to demand that the local schools revise their curricula. And if the textbooks don't do it, they can uh, get uh, curricular supplements um, from civil rights groups themselves. And actually, if any of your um, uh, viewers uh, want a, a copy of a curriculum that teaches this history accurately, you can get in touch with me and uh, I'll send it to you. Uh, so that's something we can do in the immediate uh, uh, future to begin to create an awareness. Uh, because if the next generation doesn't learn this history any better than ours have, they're going to be in as poor a position to remedy it as we have. So that's something we can do in schools uh, to begin with. And then, of course, we can create good trouble on, around other issues uh, of segregation as well. Yeah. Yeah, you, you talk in your book about the fact that there, the government was imposing segregation where it hadn't previously taken root, which again, it goes completely against this idea that uh, that people were just segregating. I mean, obviously some people were segregating themselves, but there were times where people where the government actually went in and put segregation where there had not been. And I think for us as educators, when we're working with our kids, it's really important to be able to contextualize why segregation exists for them. Because for example, we have, we'll have a kid who's making fun of another kid for being different for their skin color. And it's one thing to just be like, oh, that's wrong, we don't do that. But it's another thing to say, there's been systems of segregation in place for way before you were born and you are playing those things out. And that's why we're gonna have to take action to stop it. And for a kid, that's much easier easier to comprehend than, oh, I'm just a bad kid and I just did this for no reason and I don't understand why I'm bad. Um, but I, you're talking a lot about, you know, this kind of moment that we have this 
um, where we have kind of the attention of the nation, where those of us who are passionate about this work are able to hopefully get the ear of legislators and also the ear of our community members. And you talked about something you could do with education, but I'm wondering if you have ideas for what other steps we should be taking. What would be your first step if we could get some action going and, and make change in our country right now? Okay, uh, I'm, I'm, I've lost attention because I see in the in the chat a request that I send out the curriculum I mentioned. So I'm doing that right now. Oh, wow, that's so nice. <laughs> wow. Um, yes, okay, I think that works. I think that worked. Okay, um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, Kara. Uh, your question was what else can we do? Um, yeah, but, like for those of us who are doing that, trying to get that civil rights movement started, like we have the marches, we've got the protests. If we wanna start a civil rights movement along with it, what are the, the actions that you would recommend taking on first? Well, let me say that I am working with a, um, a group of national civil rights leaders to create a national committee to redress segregation. It's going to have four uh, areas of focus. One is, of course, the immediate urgency need, urgent need, and that is to improve the resources uh, in existing low-income segregated neighborhoods. That's always been a focus of, of, of groups that are interested in the welfare of African Americans and other low-income families, but too often we lose sight of the longer-run problems that underlie the immediate crisis. So that's one area. Second area, of course, is to open up uh, existing um, highly resourced communities, heavily white, to diverse populations. That's something that's a much more difficult task, but it needs to be an equal focus. A third is resisting displacement and gentrification, uh, massive displacement. Gentrification, you know, can be a fine thing if it's controlled, because it can convert concentrated uh, areas of disadvantage into communities that have housing for low-income families, for moderate-income families, for working-class families, and for affluent families. That would be a healthy community. Every community should be like that. But when we have gentrification that simply converts over time a low-income segregated neighborhood to a, a high-income, a mostly white segregated neighborhood, that's not a healthy form of gentrification. So, And we know what the policies are. The, the policies to resist gentrification are uh, displacement for gentrification are well known. It's a more rigorous rent control than, than we have in most places. It's limits on condominium conversions. It's inclusionary zoning that requires any new projects to have units for both low income and moderate income families as well as market rate families. Uh, and uh, so we know what these policies are. We need a new civil rights movement uh, to uh, demand them, to make good trouble, to, to require them. And then finally, we need to preserve preserve desegregation where it exists. There are many communities, uh, gentrifying communities, which are in transition, which are temporarily desegregated as they convert from low-income communities uh, to high-income communities. And we need to, when they're in transition, we need to stop that, that transition and uh, stabilize them as, as uh, desegregated communities. I'm working with a group of national civil rights leaders to create a national committee to redress segregation that will um, organize local groups of citizens. This is not something that uh, organizations, uh, nonprofit organizations, I'm talking about citizen action, organize local groups of citizens to take action. For example, in every community in this country, there are banks, there are real estate companies, there are developers whose antecedents created the segregation that we have today. We should have local civil rights groups that are oppressing those institutions to take remedial action, to create funds, to subsidize an affirmative action programs and housing that will subsidize African-Americans to move to places that are now, because of the wealth gap, unaffordable to them, but that would have been affordable to their uh, parents and grandparents had they been permitted to move to them uh, when they were created. Well, uh, again, let me say that, uh, you know, if, if um, uh, we're gonna be putting together people uh, in different communities, introducing them to each other who want to take action. And if uh, people watching this, uh, this webinar um, want to be put in touch with others in their community who are interested in becoming part of a local civil rights group, you can let me know who they are. Uh, I don't know how you want to do that. They can either write to me directly or more easily, they can write to you and you can assemble a list to send to me, uh, which includes the communities where they live, 
so that we can put uh, people together with it. And uh, we, are go we were about to launch this national committee before the pandemic hit. Uh, and uh, we've now uh, put uh, an announcement on hold because uh, right now we, it, with, that, with social distancing, you can't, we don't know how you can really organize a local committee uh, and be safe. But we soon will launch it and um, figure that out. And uh, anybody, uh, any of your, your viewers who want to participate in that, that you should let me know. Yeah, absolutely. We have, um, we put a sign in in the chat for anyone who's interested in that. Um, and we will also send it out uh, in the follow up email. So when you look for our email that has the link to this video and um, some resources about Mosaic, it'll also have the link. Wonderful. That Richard Rusty was talking about that will um, allow you to sign up for that so we can get him your information if you're interested in joining one of these different communities. Awesome. Well, I guess we're going to move to Q&A uh, in just a moment, Richard, but I wonder, I think a lot of us have come into contact with folks who just don't understand that this, like, that this history has happened and again have, have relied on the de facto segregation piece. And I wonder if you can just give kind of like a quick summation if you were trying to talk to someone to help them understand exactly like the kind of the A, B, and C of, of why we need to work on these issues right now and why, we, uh, why segregation still persists. What would be the kind of like summary statement for that? Well, I, 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 you know, uh, Kara, I think I've said it. I think, uh, you know, I, I focus, no, really, I, I, I focus on, on some of the major policies in my book. I talk about many others, but I think the major policy is the suburbanization of the country that divided, you know, before, before the suburbanization of the country that took place the, after World War II, downtown areas were much more integrated than they are today. Working class families were living, not necessarily uh, every race uh, race uh, person living next door to another race, but in broadly diverse neighborhoods, simply because uh, we were a manufacturing economy and um, factories had to be located near deep water ports or railroad terminals to get their parts and ship their final products. And so African-Americans and whites all had to live close enough to walk to work uh, in the same neighborhoods. And uh, so I, I, the suburbanization of the white working class by the federal government that I described before, I think is the key prop, uh, uh, policy, but there were many, many others. The Internal Revenue Service gave tax exemptions to local associations, to churches uh, that were organizing their communities to keep African Americans out. That was an unconstitutional policy. States had licensing agencies that licensed real estate agents uh, to, um, in, in, to create and perpetuate racial segregation. The National Association of Real Estate Boards had a code of ethics until the 1950s that explicitly said it was a violation of a realtor's ethical responsibility to sell a home to a white, in a white neighborhood to a black family. So, and that's, that was a 14th Amendment violation when state licensing agencies licensed realtors with those. So we need to learn these policies. Uh, we need to learn this history because every one of them was unconstitutional, a civil rights violation. And one thing we learned, I hope, in the course of the last century is if we have a civil rights violation, we, every one of us, has an obligation to remedy it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know that the Constitution, you talk about it multiple times in the book about how it is misused and misrepresented, which has happened obviously multiple times in history where the, where the government or some group of people uh, use the Constitution not for its actual, like what we would hope is its actual purpose, which is to protect and take care of the people within this country. Um, and yeah, my mom uh, loves some of your, like I forgot to mention that I read this book with my mom a few months back and the, her, one of her favorite passages is just talking about the ways that, you know, we could start to think about the things that you've been talking about and that are outlined even in greater detail in your book about how we can make, um, how we can make a difference now that considering maybe, uh, you know, giving black families houses at the rates that they would have gotten them, you know, if there hadn't been all of the segregation that was put into place. So. I just want to give one more plug to if you haven't had a chance to check out the book to definitely check it out because there's so much more going on um, than even what we've had time to talk about today. But with that said, I want to um, get into the questions we're right at around 2.45 now and I know there were a ton of questions in the chat. Um, so why don't we start with this one? Uh, oh, you kind of answered this one. We'll start with, oh, okay. Uh, we'll 
conversation, but I will pass along this question that is political. And the question is, what is your reaction to Trump's recent declaration that suburban voters will no longer be bothered by low income housing? Um, yeah. Well, this is uh, actually an interest. We would have a different reaction to this if we knew the history. In 1970, uh, Richard Nixon had a Secretary of Housing and Urban Development whose name was George Romney, the father of the present Utah Senator. George Romney had a program that was, if anything, more aggressive than the affirmatively furthering fair housing program that the Obama administration implemented and that Trump has now revoked. George Romney uh, said, as I say this, the, the subtitle of my book is A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America. Nothing hidden about it. George Romney said the federal government has created a white noose around every metropolitan downtown area in this country. And the federal government now has an obligation to untie that noose. And George Romney proposed to withhold uh, uh, funds, block grants and other funds, green space funds, uh, sidewalk repair funds, to any suburb that didn't take uh, steps to desegregate, actual withhold funds. And he went ahead and withheld funds from three suburban communities in 1970. One was a suburb of Detroit, one was a suburb of Baltimore, another was a suburb of Cleveland. There was an enormous backlash uh, uh, among whites uh, against this policy. And Nixon, uh, who was pandering at that point to, to uh, whites on a racial basis, uh, uh, canceled uh, Romney's uh, uh, withholding of the funds. He forced Romney out as Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. Um, he was able to do that because there was no civil rights movement at that time that was going to stop him. The civil rights movement had pretty much ebbed at the end of the 1960s. Uh, the Obama administration then resuscitated that program in something called the Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing Program. It required every community to take an assessment of the extent to which it's segregated, understand how it became segregated, why it's segregated, and to propose plans to address that segregation. And the idea was that at some point in the future, long after the Obama administration left office, funds could be withheld from suburbs that refused to desegregate. That's the program that uh, Trump um, uh, canceled. But it hadn't come to the point where any uh, funds were actually withheld, where every suburb actually had to take steps uh, under this program uh, to, to redress segregation. And I, I, I know I'm sounding like a broken record, but unless uh, a new civil rights movement is organized uh, to um, support that kind of program. It won't, uh, it won't succeed even if Trump didn't uh, cancel it. So the, the important thing to remember is that uh, without public support, you know, we, we, we redress segregation of lunch counters and buses and colleges and universities and schools, um, uh, legal segregation of schools in the 1960s with a massive civil rights movement that had broad support, not necessarily majority support, but enough support to force the government to take action. And simply uh, today, talking about things government should do without creating the political support for it to do it uh, may make us feel good, but uh, it's not going to accomplish the solution to these problems that we need. Yeah. I think what I'm hearing too is just the fact that we are so segregated from one another, I think, you know, be, makes it hard to build those connections as you were talking about, like, if you want to have your, the civil rights group that actually represent lots of different communities. And as you mentioned, like, white people have been the majority of people protesting, but there's still just like not a lot of pro cultural connection across these lines of difference. And it sounds like building those coalitions is really important, which is obviously very closely aligned to our work as well. Um, so thank you for that. And and um, I will move on to the next question, which is, are banks still allowed to have lending practices that favor particular types of owners, including race and gender? Yes, um, there are so many issues we can work on, and um, uh, this is one of them. Once we establish these segregated patterns with explicit racial policies 
we no longer need explicit racial policies to perpetuate them. So for example, when banks examine credit scores to evaluate eligibility for um, uh, mortgages, those, that, that examination has the effect of excluding African Americans from eligibility for mortgages, even without being racially explicit. For example, if you um, uh, uh, apply for a mortgage and you have a credit history that shows that you've always paid your previous mortgage payment on time in a previous house that you own, that helps you get the mortgage. But paying, having paid your rent in time doesn't count. And so the credit scoring has what lawyers call a disparate impact on African-Americans. Uh, the banks don't say that they're doing this uh, for racial reasons. They just say that paying mortgage payments on time shows you have good credit. And paying rent on time doesn't, doesn't show it. They don't say that it has anything to do with race, but it has a racially, ex a racially uh, uh, a disparate impact. And there are many, many policies that we follow today that don't require explicit racial language, but that have a, a, the effect of perpetuating racial segregation. And these are the kinds of things that local civil rights groups have to challenge. We have, for example, let me just give one other example. We have a law uh, uh, called the Community Reinvestment Act uh, that some of you may be familiar with. It requires banks to uh, lend money to issue mortgages, for example, in the same communities they take deposits from. So if a bank has a branch and is taking deposits uh, from families in a low-income neighborhood, it has to lend money in those neighborhoods. Well, some banks meet that obligation by lending to gentrifiers, not to people who've traditionally lived in those neighborhoods. That policy has a disparate impact on African-Americans and, and on other low-income families, but it's not explicitly racial. Gentrifiers have better credit scores than people who've lived in those neighborhoods. So um, there are many, many policies that we follow that have a disparate impact on African-Americans that perpetuate segregation and each one of them uh, can be challenged by local civil rights groups with their local banks and other institutions. Yeah, I think this leads well into a, another question here about, um, so we, we're hearing about how all these systems are being perpetuated without it, without it because of the systems that are already in place, but are there cities or towns, or even I, I think we'll add organizations that um, subsidize the move of black or other families in their jurisdiction whose example we can follow. So is, are there examples of this, of people working against this actively where it's going well? Yes, there are. There are, well, uh, uh, Alameda County in uh, California that includes Oakland has a down payment assistance program uh, that uh, helps, uh, helps uh, uh, First-time home buyers, which who are disproportionately minority, African American and Hispanic, helps them to uh, purchase homes. There are many other communities in the country where where there are down payment assistance programs. They're not nearly adequate enough, but uh, there are communities like that. Uh, there are other programs that uh, help to um, desegregate, to redress segregation to an extent. That uh, you're all familiar, I know, with the. Um, low-income housing tax credit program, or maybe you're not, but it's the biggest federal subsidy to housing for low-income families. I'm not talking about home ownership now. It's a tax credit to developers to build projects in which the rents are affordable to the lowest income families. The Treasury Department, which issues these tax credits, places a priority on placing tax credit developments in already low-income neighborhoods, reinforcing their segregation. That's crazy. We should not refuse to, to improve housing in those neighborhoods. We should, that should be a priority, but we should also have a priority on placing uh, developments that uh, are affordable to the lowest income families in high opportunity communities where there's access to good jobs and transportation and grocery stores selling healthy food where there's healthy air. Um, that there are some communities that have uh, to a greater extent, ignored the Treasury Department's guidance and placed more of their low-income house credit, uh, low-income housing tax credit uh, projects in higher opportunity communities. That's something that local civil rights groups can um, demand uh, take place when these tax credits are awarded in their communities. 
the Section 8 voucher program, which I know you're familiar with, which subsidizes uh, low-income families, uh, uh, their rents, uh, also perpetuates segregation because the easiest place to use uh, Section 8 vouchers is in existing low-income neighborhoods. The landlords are happy to rent to you. They get a, a, an excessive amount in rent because the tax credit, um, I'm uh, sorry, the Section 8 um, subsidies are calculated on an area-wide basis. So that the subsidies are too low uh, to um, uh, rent an apartment in a high opportunity community and too high to rent an apartment in a low-income segregated neighborhood. So the landlords raise their rents above what um, uh, the market requires when they rent to Section 8 voucher families. This is another policy that can be attacked uh, at a local level. Uh, there are some communities that have um, addressed that by uh, increasing the voucher amount uh, for higher income, uh, for opportunity, higher opportunity neighborhoods, and de decreased it uh, in, in low income segregated neighborhoods. But very few communities have done that. Uh, it's something that uh, it can be done on a widespread basis. The policies to redress segregation are well known. We know what to do. What's missing, as I've said, is a civil rights movement that's going to make it uncomfortable uh, to continue to maintain policies that perpetuate segregation. All right, I think we maybe have time for just one more question. Um, there's been kind of a lot of talk about policy, and so I'm gonna just try and sum this into one question, so hopefully we're answering a few. Um, someone referenced the, the Roberts decision, which we now know is I mean, which was then obviously not the right decision for the, based on the segregation that's already taken place. Um, but we're wondering, the people are wondering about just co the constitution in general and bringing um, lawsuits, is there statute of limitations for these lawsuits? Um, is there a local policy that's already being enacted that people can follow and support? Well, this can't be addressed by litigation uh, initially although certainly civil rights lawyers will have a lot to do in defending civil rights groups if they uh, succeed in um, demanding and, and creating policies to redress segregation. As, as your question suggested, uh, nobody would really have standing at this point under our current legal system to challenge um, the effects of policies that were enacted 50, 60, 70 years ago. Uh, but uh, understanding this history uh, creates a different constitutional framework for implementing policies to remedy it. So if we had an affirmative action policy in housing, where we uh, gave subsidies to African Americans to purchase homes in communities that uh, they were excluded from uh, previously, that would certainly be challenged uh, by uh, people who are opposed to um, redressing segregation, and we would have to defend it in court, defend those policies in court, based on the history that we uncovered. So um, there is a role for the courts, but the first role has to be local action, mobilized citizens who uh, demand and press for policies to redress segregation, and that then, uh, if those, they succeed in enacting those policies, that defend them in court. All right, we've got two minutes, so I think we'll go ahead and, um, and, and close here and give kind of the final announcements and all of those things. Um, Richard, thank you so much for being with us. I know that so many people were um, inspired and motivated by your work and your talk. Thank you so, 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 so much for taking the time out of your day to be here with us. Um, we will again send out the link to um, for your civil rights group um, to all of the participants. Again, you'll get that in your email. You can also scroll through the chat and find the link for it. There it is in the chat. Um, for folks who want to stay on a little bit longer and kind of talk about our work into segregation, the Mosaic Project and their work, um, you can do that. We'll also put the link for our video so you can learn a little bit more about our work if you hadn't had the chance to see that before. Um, and yeah, again, we'll, a few of our facilitators and educators will stay online and answer questions about that. But we are going to let uh, Richard free. Thank you again so much. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure being with you this morning. Thank you. All right. Have a good afternoon. Thanks. And again, for any questions about Mosaic, we'll stay on for just a few more minutes. Uh, Laura Mandel, who's the founder of the Mosaic Project, is also here in the chat, and I'm sure we'll be happy to answer questions if you have them. Otherwise, we will close in just a couple of minutes.
Is it Kara or Kara? It's Kara. Hi, Kara. Tiffany, how are you? Nice to meet you, Tiffany. I'm fine. Like, how are you doing? Good, good. I was going to ask on your in your work with Mosaic, um, what are you finding is the way, one of the best ways or an avenue to meet that resistance of, oh, this is uncomfortable, especially when you're working with children um, that are white, you know, or, or, or don't have a non-BIPOC um, identity that they're working through um, to understand race and racism in general. Yeah. You know, I think there's a lot of things going on. Working with children, I will say, is easier than working with adults. We do work with adults too. Um, <laughs> the nice thing about kids is that, you know, they go to school every day with the expectation that they're gonna learn for the most part. Um, and so the idea that there's segregation, that there's discrimination actually isn't so foreign to them. Um, and I think especially younger children have a real strong sense of fairness and what's unfair. Um, and so we don't usually have a problem saying like, there are uh, ways in which people who look different from us are discriminated against face segregation, face these like different things in our communities. And those things are unfair because the kids understand fairness really, really well. Um, and so we do work very, very intentionally with kids of all different backgrounds, including white children, including upper class children um, who benefited from these things that we're talking about. And we think that, you know, helping them to understand that is really having them interact with people who are different from themselves, which unfortunately, mm -hmm very often because our communities are so segregated. Um, and so in the Bay Area, one of the most diverse places in the world, many of our students are really getting to know kids from different backgrounds for the first time. And so wow. for a big part of it is actually putting that into action, putting it into practice and letting them meet people who are different and then pairing that with real tools that they can use and, and being honest with them about what's going on in the world right now. Because mm -hmm. they, yeah. Thank you so much, Cara. Thank you, no, thanks for being here. All right. Oh, hi. Hi. Um, I'm interested in, let me turn on so I can see myself or whatever. Um, I am interested, and I put the question on chat, in local activism, um, because the neighborhood I live in, I mean, the city I live in, Redondo Beach, is extremely adverse to low-income housing and any type of, you know, just additional housing for people and we desperately need it, especially in the affordable set. So if you could address that, and I'm happy to get involved, you know, um, on a local level to make those changes happen. But I'd love to hear that information. Yeah, you know, I personally don't have a lot of information in the Redondo Beach area because uh, we're based in Northern California, unfortunately. Um, but I do think it's a, if you have, if you're able, joining Richard's um, civil rights group is is probably a good way to get in touch with other like-minded individuals in your area. Um, obviously, if you're interested in us, you can join our mailing list and we can we can send you resources that for us. But again, we're primarily an education organization. So if you're interested gotcha. in local activism, um, I do recommend signing up for Richard's group as as he um, as he suggested. And again, that'll be in the email that we send out subsequently, and hopefully that'll get you connected with some like-minded folks. Okay, I'm already part of Yimby. You're familiar with them? Do they have that up there in that bay in the Bay Area? We do have Yimby here, although there is some pushback in the Bay Area because people feel like, uh, like you know, it's we don't want huge developments like that are going to cater to folks who are gentrifying. So there are some. There's a group called Shimby here, which is social housing in my backyard <laughs> instead of yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. I think that's a great a great place to start to look at local organizations that what you're doing already uh, looking at local organizations that are fighting for for you know more integrated housing and more social housing and and again these uh, social housing as richard talked about because it was something that was uh for you know for a very long time something that catered sure. to middle income families yeah yeah thank you so much for putting on this program excellent excellent oh, thank you so much we really I'm, I'm really glad to have you here we hope you'll stay connected all right. Yeah, we will. We will. I'll get the email. Thanks. Um, bye. All right. Don't think I've missed any other questions. If anyone has any more questions, you can feel free to hop on video or throw them in the chat. My mom is saying I look beautiful. Thanks, mom. <laughs> But yeah, again, the five minute video is on um, in the chat. It's also all over our website. We also have an action guide for families for folks who are looking about um, at how to talk to their children about race and racism. Um, and otherwise, we are going to go ahead and hop off again. The book is The Color of Law. So if you're interested in that, you can just sign up for Richard's um, 
group and also please do stay connected to the Mosaic Project. We are um, doing a series of events and speakers. And so if you liked this event and are interested in seeing more, um, please stay in touch with us and, and join our email list, check out the videos. And um, thank you. Have a great one.